Okay, yeah, I'd like to thank you, Vincenzo, for your uh, kind invitation to give this talk. So I press a few buttons and hopefully you will see uh, the first slide soon. Uh, by the way, do you see the cursor here, a dot moving? So did you see now input goal? I, I don't, oh, oh yes, it's very small. It's because it's a small point, right? Yeah. Okay. I but, 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 uh, maybe. Uh, hmm, yeah. But you um, uh, can see now five or six lines on the slide. What? what sorry. What? Yes, we, do. we can see here. Yes. Okay. So the, the last line is finding correct definitions. You can see. Right. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay, so um, uh, proof mining, yeah, so originated as a kind of uh, uh, modern reformulation of Kreisel's unwinding program, uh, which focused more on questions in algebra and uh, number theory. Uh, and here the focus is in analysis. So starting from my PhD thesis in 1990, um, I worked on applying uh, proof transformations to extract a new uh, computational information from prima facie in effect, non effective proofs in analysis. So, the point is here you have some proof P of a conclusion C, which may use um, non effective principles. And the goal is to extract additional information on this conclusion. So, that could be quantitative information such as explicit effective bounds, but also in recent years, a more and more prominent became qualitative aspects so for example to show that um, the bounds do not depend on certain parameters also to generalize proofs by omitting hypotheses which turn out to be superfluous or at least could be weakened in a substantial way and also finding the right uh, proper notions uh, to develop new notions in analysis which originated by this uh, program okay so now I consider proof mining as a kind of applied uh, proof theory. And of course, proof theory has its origin in uh, foundational issues uh, like Hilbert's consistency program. But I claimed on other occasions, I gave recently a talk at the Urbino seminar where I claimed that even Hilbert had already in mind uh, what I call uh, proof mining here. So a much broader uh, scheme than just uh, establishing consistency. So numerous case studies have been carried out, particularly in nonlinear analysis areas such as fixed point theory, ergodic theory, non-smooth optimization, abstract Cauchy problems, and many others. And it turned out that in now we have more than 100 case studies. In basically all case studies, the computational content is actually of low complexity and can be stated in ordinary mathematical terms. So there's no need to uh, use the Ackermann function or anything uh, like that. And I called this uh, some years ago in an article, the proof theoretic tameness of ordinary mathematics. You know, there's a notion of model theoretic tameness. Um, where tameness is guaranteed, so the absence of Gödel phenomena is guaranteed uh, by the use of tame structures like a O minimal structures, so where you cannot, you don't have access to the natural numbers and you cannot apply coding arguments and so on. But here, of course, in, in analysis, we can. And so, in principle, um, Gödelian phenomena or huge growth phenomena could happen. It just turns out as an empirical effect that they, they don't. And they call this uh, proof theoretic tameness. Yeah, and as I mentioned here, there are more than 100 case studies of that kind uh, which uh, support this. Yeah, not only um, are these scattered uh, ad hoc individual applications, you know, sometimes Kreisel's unwinding program has been criticized, for example, by Solomon Pfefferman as ad hoc and not really using logic. Um, here, we actually have general uh, logical meter theorems, uh, which explain uh, these uh, um, applications, at least the general form of them. So a, a logical meter theorem means if you have a statement having a certain logical form and you can formalize a proof in a suitable system, then a certain additional information is guaranteed. And I started this for my PhD thesis in 1990 and then in 93 uh, was published uh, in the special context of 
Polish and compact Polish uh, spaces. And however, most applications in the recent, yeah, in the past two decades, deal with so-called abstract classes of spaces like arbitrary Hilbert spaces and so on, where there's no separability assumption made. And that plays a crucial role. And I developed the logical meter theorems for those in a transactions paper in 2005. And this was further elaborated in a paper jointly with Gerardi in 2008. And since then, many other uh, extensions and variants of this general scheme have been developed. You will see a little bit in some easy instances of this uh, soon. Okay, so now I come to the next slide, uh, proof interpretation. So the main uh, proof theoretic tools used here are not um, cut elimination or normalization or epsilon substitution or things like that, which perform a global rebuilding of the original proof and causing a Kalman non-elementary uh, increase in the size of the proof. Rather, we use, um, rather than to eliminate cuts or modus ponens, I use here yeah, proof interpretations, which give a trivial interpretation to the modus ponens. And by that, uh, this means that the original uh, structure of the proof remains largely intact. So suppose we have here two theories, T1 and T2, with respective language LT1 and LT2. And then such a proof interpretation assigns to each formula A in LT1 by induction on A, a, a new formula AI, its interpretation on LT2. And moreover, it transforms any proof P in TI of A into a proof PI of AI. And that goes by induction on P. And the new interpreted proof PI is not essentially longer than the original one because we keep the usual lemmata structure intact. And of course, the interpretation has to be set, has to be set up in such a way that um, the interpretation AI, when it comes to the conclusion C, carries the additional information uh, we are looking for. And the main uh, methods here are modern extensions, uh, refinements, reformulations, adaptations, and so on, of basically Gödel's uh, original dialectical interpretation. Okay. Now, the dialectical interpretation of Gödel uh, prima facie only applies to intuitionistic systems, but uh, by um, preprocessing and embedding of a classical reasoning into an approximate intuitionistic reasoning, um, one can actually apply this to classical proofs. And this is meaningful, this composition, since, um, um, for example, the Markov principle is uh, validated by the Gödel interpretation, and hence one recovers from the double negations, from certain double negations introduced by the double negation translation. Okay, so now the formal systems are um, yeah, extensions of the usual uh, systems of number theory in all finite types. Yeah, the functional interpretation interprets proofs, even if the original statement uses only natural number quantifiers. If you have nested quantifiers, that gets interpreted by higher and higher types functionals. And so one uses um, finite type uh, systems of Peano and Mutic, PA, Omega. Essentially, such systems are already in Hilbert's work on infinity from 26, where he defined Gödel's T for the first time. So the primitive recursive functionals of a finite type. But as I said, in the recent applications, we usually uh, have abstract in addition to the concrete natural numbers and then the finite types over those like number theoretic functions. So we have bare space and having bare space, we can encode poly spaces and so on. Uh, but we have uh, some abstract type X, which stands, let's say, for an arbitrary Hilbert space. And then we form uh, close up under finite types and we call the resulting system PA omega X. And now we do not just want to have number theory, but actually full analysis. So one way of adding here is uh, to achieve this is, for example, to add the axiom of dependent choice in all types. This means in particular, we add the axiom of countable choice in all types, which in particular means we add full comprehension over numbers. So number theory with second order number theory with arbitrary comprehension um, is a subsystem of this here. 
Of course, in practice, only small fragments of that will be used, but for simplicity, let's just say we have that. Now, important is here, as always, uh, with functional interpretations, the notion of equality. So, it should be such that the prime formulas, the atomic formulas of our system should be decidable. Now, equality between objects of Hilbert space time X, for instance, this is not a primitive notion. It's not treated as a quantifier free uh, notion, but it is a defined notion. So we define this by saying, well, the metric distance, I write this here with a metric D, because in general we have just a metric and not a norm. In this case of Hilbert space, it would be just uh, the norm X minus Y, that that equals as a real number zero. And real numbers are encoded as usual as fast Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. And if you do that, then this equality here between reals is a pi zero one predicate. Okay, so equality is an abbreviation for this uh, pi zero one statement. And then there's a crucial thing. Um, we may not, we mu uh, must not include right away an extensionality axiom stating that if two objects are equal and you have a map T from X to X, uh, that then so here T is, um, can you uh, uh, see what I write here with the pen? Hello? Yes, so, now, yes, now we can see. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, uh, so we have only the rule of extensionality. So if you prove that S equals T, then T of S, then you can derive from that, that T of S equals T of T. We will see later, this is actually of crucial uh, significance, because if we would have the equality axiom, then the approach of extracting uniform bounds would translate this into saying if S and T approximately equal, then T of S and T of T approximately equal, which means it basically says that T is uniformly continuous. And that's actually an axiom made in the model theoretic treatment of Banner spaces in positive bounded logic on continuous logic. It's assumed uh, that all constants are uniformly continuous, but we want to treat also discontinuous uh, objects and that plays an important role in applications and for that we have to be careful uh, with extensionality. And now um, we call this system here A, uh, uh, calligraphic A omega, this would be the system of full classical analysis A omega uh, x, uh, but now we add um, whatever we want to express about our metric structure or our abstract uh, space X, for example, that is a norm space or the uniform convex space or Hilbert space. So that needs to be ex uh, stated by additional uh, axioms. Good. And then the main uh, thrust of this methodology is to keep track of uniform bounds. So to in the analysis of a proof. And that is done by a notion of measurization, which in its simplest form was defined first by uh, Bill Howard. And here we extend this to the abstract types. So suppose now you have a type rho in this finite type structure over the natural numbers and the abstract type x, then we define uh, eternal, yeah, we define uh, first of all, binary relation saying an object is a measurement in a suitable sense of an object of type rho. Now the measurement is not of type rho, but the measurement is of type uh, hat rho. And hat rho results uh, from rho by replacing everywhere x by n. So for example, an object of type x, a point in our say norm space, is measurized not by a point in the norm space, but by a natural number, namely a natural number, which happens to be an upper bound uh, for the norm of uh, Y. And so in this way, the whole computation takes place on these measurements. So the measurements are natural numbers or number theoretic functions or things like that. And that's why we can have here usual notions of uh, computability, so we don't need uh, computable analysis, so it's not required that the, say, Hilbert space X is an effective Hilbert space effectively presented, because we don't need to say what it means for a point to be computable, or what it means for 
and, and function f from x to x uh, to be computable. All what we uh, need to know is what it means for measurement to be computable, but a measurement of a function from x to x is just a number threaded function. And so spelled out for the particular case of um, uh, yeah, self-mappings f from x to x, which I have stated here in the middle of the slide, which I hopefully you can see by now, um, we have that um, a number theoretic function f star measurizes f if it has the following property that every natural number upper bound n for the norm of x gets mapped into a natural number upper bound f star of n of the norm of f of x. Now, not every mapping f is measurable, it's a strong restriction, but for example, many classes are. A class which will be particularly significant for this talk will be the class of non-expansive functions or Lipschitz 1 functions f. And in this case, um, a measurement, or what is needed to define a measurement is to know the norm of f at some point. So for example, zero. If you know a norm upper bound b on f of zero, then just the mapping n goes to n plus b will be a measurement of f. Okay. Yeah, and in a metric setting uh, where we don't have um, a norm, uh, we use a ternary relation relative with a reference point. So we have a reference point in the uh, which we choose in our space, and we define measurability as distance from that reference point. And in the norm case, the reference point is simply uh, zero. Okay, so I wait a minute before, so that you can oops, uh, see um, this general logical meter frame. So this is a particular simple case, um, which however explains already the first application I want to talk about. And I don't want to convolute this here by general uh, messy logical formulas. So a very special case of such a general logical meter theorem of these, which I designed in 2005 and defined with Gerardi in 2008 is as follows. Suppose now we have our formal system A omega uh, with an abstract uh, normed space. And suppose we have um, a concretely represented compact metric space K, let's say uh, the unit interval. And then we have here an arbitrary Polish space just for simplicity, uh, let that be bare space in order to avoid to have to talk about names so whenever we have now an for all exist statement, so we have an for all exist statement. And in this particular case, um, okay, for all exist statement where the parameters range over bare space or some Polish space, let's say the continuous functions on 0, 1, C0, 1, that could be such a space. And we have parameters ranging over compact space, let's say some compact rectangle. And we have two parameters having to do with our abstract space X, a point, let's say, and a self map. And let's assume just for uh, specificity that the self map is non expensive as uh, before. And suppose now we can prove um, under these assumptions that an existential statement holds. So where we focus on this number theoretic existential quantifier here and then the matrix may contain further existential quantifiers, but not a mixture of universal and existential quantifiers. Then what one can extract from such a proof is a computable function of phi, which only depends on this name here from the bare space, from the Polish space, and on these measurizing data. So we have to measurize the Z and we have to measurize uh, the T. We are independent from the compact uh, space K. So, uh, so we have a kind of fan rule or uniform uniformity principle. Uh, but what is more striking is that we have uniformity even with respect to this abstract space uh, X. So the only thing we need is to bound the norm of Z. So let's suppose the norm of Z is bounded by B. And as we showed on the previous slide, to measureize t, all what we need is to have a norm bound on t of zero. So that b be also a norm bound of that. So if you have a b which is bigger than both uh, the norm of z and the norm of t zero, then that's all what we need in addition to 
X uh, to produce our bond. Uh, and there's no separate, this only works because the proof does not make any separability assumption. If the proof would have used that X is separable, then that would have been upgraded in total boundedness and so in essentially compactness. So it's crucial to treat the abstract space X as abstract and not as separately represented, even though mostly one is interested in applying the extracted bound to separable spaces. But of course, this bound now holds for all spaces X, or in particular for several of the spaces. But it's very crucial not to, uh, um, you know, uh, to keep the proof such that it doesn't use the fact that the space is separable. So similarly, so this was here the meter theorem for non-spaces, it's exactly the same for Hilbert spaces. Then, of course, the bound is on developed in all Hilbert spaces. It also works for uniformly convex. Um, Banner spaces, then the bound additionally depends on what is called a modulus of convexity eta and so on. And in a metric setting, uh, as I said, where we need a reference point, we would in this case take as our reference point the point Z. And if we do that, then the measurement for Z is zero because Z has zero distance from Z. And so all what we need is then um, a bound B on this, what is called a dis displacement. Uh, of Z performed by uh, T. Okay, and you know, lots of structures can be treated. I have here a long list of uh, structures. So the structures have to have the right uniformity built in. So, for example, uh, uniformly convex structures are okay, strictly convex are not because they get immediately upgraded to uniformly convex. Uniformly smooth is okay. Uh, smooth would be a immediately upgraded to uniform smooth. Separa separability we have, would be allowed, but it would immediately be upgraded to total boundedness. So these classes which I have here are basically fixed points under the functional interpretation, so they don't get changed. And if you're a little bit of familiar with uh, positive bounded logic and the model theory of um, Banner spaces, then you see here yeah, some similarity and in fact, all classes which can be axiomatized by positive bounded logic are allowed here uh, as well. And you know, you can explain this uniformity also in terms of ultra products. So these structures here are closed under ultra products and ultra roots. So, this, so for example, if you have a, a strictly convex space and the ultra product is um, automatically uh, uniformly convex. I mean, in, in the ultra product of the space is strictly convex if and only if it's uniformly convex. So then we have admissible classes of functions, various classes we saw already, uh, Lipschitzian functions uh, and many others. You might uh, think that, you know, the more restrictive you get, uh, and this is then obvious, if you have a larger class then you also have it for the smaller class, that's not. Uh, so typically the things get more difficult if you nail it down uh, to uh, more additional properties because the more properties you assume about your space or the class of functions, the more uh, theorems get into the picture, the more proofs become possible. And you have, of course, to check that these conditions can be stated in a form so that they have a tame uh, good functional interpretation. And But that is valid for, for, for these classes here. Sometimes one needs an additional inputs. For example, if you work with a class of Lipschitzian functions, then of course the bound will depend on the Lipschitz constant. And most importantly, also discontinuous functions can be treated. And this has been recently uh, crucially used in optimization, where people use set-valued operators and um, where you, there isn't even a proper notion of continuity or if you define it in terms of how stuff distances becomes much too restrictive. Good. So now wait a, a minute, uh, uh, not a minute, but three seconds so that you can see this slide on Bauschke. So Raphael, do you see the slide on Bauschke? Yes, we do. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, just to make this here less abstract, um, here's one of my, um, one of the applications which is particularly suitable for presentations because um, the problem can be explained very easily and 
the result extracted is very nice. So here we have an arbitrary Hilbert space and we have a finite collection of closed convex non-empty subsets C1 to Cn. And we have the corresponding metric projections onto this uh, convex sets. You know, in Hilbert space, uh, whenever you have a convex closed set and you have a point, uh, then there is a unique uh, point in this set C, uh, which has the closest distance to your given point X. And that is uh, the metric projection. And by the way, the metric projection in Hilbert space is not expensive. This actually characterizes Hilbert space and language bar space. And um, now, one performs the so-called cyclic projection method. So you project to C1, then you project to C2, you project to C3 up to Cn. You take this whole package, let's call that T, and now you iterate T. And suppose uh, this is a classical problem which goes back already to von Neumann, uh, where it was basically started for half spaces and for n being two. Suppose you have two sets, C1 and C2. So here's C2, here's C1. And now you take a point, and now you project to C1, and now you project to C2, and now you project to C1, and now you project to C2, and now you project to C1, and now you project to C2. Whoops. Uh, then you see uh, some, somehow things don't change uh, much after a while. And that is precisely what the statement here says. If n is large enough and you apply this projection package one more time, basically you get the same value. So that these distances here tend to zero. So this property of a function t is called asymptotic regularity. And it was a long-standing open problem, um, the so-called zero displacement conjecture, whether in this generality this holds. You know, in special cases uh, stated here, n being two or half spaces or um, f having a fixed point, which in particular would be the case if the intersection is non-empty, uh, then it's much easier. But here in particular, the C1 to Cn will have an empty intersection. So this is also sometimes called an inconsistent feasibility problem. And this was finally solved by uh, Bauschke and he used the whole arsenal of abstract uh, set valued operator theory. So I list here these uh, principles. And on the other hand, um, the meter theorems are applicable because one can easily show that this actually decreases to zero. And if you decrease to zero, then the conversion statement is actually pi two, yeah? because it says uh, for every k, there is an n so large so that uh, this distance here is smaller than let's say 2 to the minus k. You can omit the innermost quantifier from that moment on because if it's decreasing that's automatic. So this is a for all exist statement so therefore it is in the shape of the meter theorem and what does the meter theorem now guarantee? Well it says all what we need is a measurement of the data. So what are the data? The data are the starting point of this iteration. So that is this point X and the measurement would be just a non-bound on that. And we need measurements for the projections. But, it's, but to measureize a non-expensive function, it suffices as we discussed to have a bound on, that, on the norm of that function applied to zero. But suppose now you take just any point in any point C1 and Cn in your uh, sets, capital C1 and capital Cn. So suppose for any point you may choose, you have a norm bond. Then that is enough to give a norm bond for the norm of the projection to zero, because I mean, the projection to zero is the element in Ci which has the smallest norm. But lowercase i is an element in Ci. So it has to have a norm at least as big as this one. And if you know for some element an upper bound, uh, then that's enough. And so this is all what you need to know. And as a result, uh, the logical meter frame guarantees that Bausch's proof must contain um, uh, 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 four argument number theoretic function. I mean, you can represent epsilon as two to the minus k again, such that um, uh, you have a rate of convergence and these four data are the error, epsilon, alias two to the minus k, the number n of uh, sets, 
C1 to Cn and this uh, B here and this K. So I asked actually uh, Adrian Lewis, who was one of the people who formulated the conjecture in the first place, uh, whether the people knew anything about such a phi, and at that time nothing was known. But now using um, uh, proof theory, and one could actually establish this phi here, and as you see, although it looks a bit convoluted, it's actually a low degree polynomial in all four data. So it's polynomial in all for data epsilon n b and k that's very explicit so this is what i refer to as uh, proof theoretic tameness so despite of the fact that one uses here abstract theorems which are closely related to um, source lemma like minty's maximal extension theorem yeah, an operator every monotone operator has a maximal monotone um, extension and an operator is maximal monotone if and only if identity plus that operator has full range. Uh, this is crucially used in the proof, but you know the proof theoretic analysis gives a very low complexity uh, result. And that was, uh, I generalized this already to a much larger class of mappings, not just projections, but so-called Fermi non-expensive mappings of which projections are a special case. And later Bauschke and collaborators generalize their result to an even larger class of mapping, so-called averaged maps, and Andre Ziposch generalized my analysis to that and gave a quantitative version. And most recently, Andre Ziposch proved a new qualitative result, um, namely for so-called super strongly non-expensive maps by generalizing his treatment of averaged mappings. So here there wasn't even the, the qualitative convergence result known. So the qualitative convergence result is a corollary to the extension of the mind quantitative result for averaged mappings together with the theory of super strongly non-expensive mappings, which recently had been uh, developed by uh, people in Bauschke's uh, school, like uh, Mosi and in particular. So this is already here. Here we have a qualitatively new result, uh, which uh, uh, came out of this. So I want to say a few uh, things about how this works. So the, the proof has of, Brack, of, of um, Bauschke has two major pillars. One is the theory of so-called strongly non-expensive maps, and the other one is this aforementioned abstract um, maximum monotone operator theory with Minty and so on. Now let's first talk about the strongly non-expensive map. Now, a map is called strongly non-expansive if for any sequences x1 and y, uh, xn and y, and this implication here holds. Now, if you look at this from a logical point of view, it means pi 3 implies pi 3. But actually, this can be stated uh, in a for all exist, for all form. And if you do, then you have this, uh, what is written here in this remark. And the proper quantitative version of that is to say we have a modulus delta depending on D and epsilon satisfying here this statement. Now, if you invent, in, in, invent such a notion like a modulus of being strongly non-expensive, there are two desiderata. First of all, it has to be strong enough uh, and sufficient for your quantitative analysis. And secondly, you must be able to actually produce in all cases of interest. But it's guaranteed that you are able to produce in all cases of instances, because if you just take the, if you could prove this in a theory which admits a meter theorem, then you can in particular, of course, prove uh, the, the non-uniform version. So where I just swap the quantifiers here, which is called strictly non-expensive. And then you apply the meter theorem to this, you get a uniform bound on delta. Now, if you write delta as one over n, it's an upper bound on n. Uh, you get a uniform bound on delta depending only on d and epsilon. So from any proof that a map is strongly non-expensive, this is in particular a proof that a map is strictly non-expensive, from that you can extract by the very logical meter theorem this modulus. And that's why we have these modulus all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, so here's, here's uh, the definition uh, again, and um, now, and in all reasonable cases, we, we know this model is omega, and it's usually some simple polynomial. 
Now, what is the point uh, of strongly non-expensive maps? The metric projections are non-expensive and even firmly non-expensive. But the firmly non-expensive maps are not close under composition. And you know, we compose these projections. PC1 composed with PC2 composed with PC3. So what do we know about a composition of such maps? Well, the only thing we know is that they are strongly non-expensive because every firmly non-expensive maps is, is strongly non-expensive and those are closed under composition. And this becomes quantitatively here, this last proposition. If you have finitely many strongly non-expensive maps with respective modeling, then you can show that the composition is strongly non-expensive and you can actually compute the new models in this simple way. And in the case of nice uh, banner spaces, uniformly convex banner spaces, firmly non-expensive implies uh, uniformly non-expensive uh, strongly non-expensive and you get a modulus and in the case of Hilbert space that's the only case which is of interest here to us you get this very uh, simple quadratic uh, modulus and now you can apply the previous results so you have this modulus in particular for the projections and by this very simple formula you get the, uh, a modulus for the composition of the projections so that is uh, one thing and the next thing is uh, the theory of uh, Reich and Brack about these operators. And what they proved is if the displacement, uh, the, the minimal possible displacement is defined as rho. And if rho is zero, if rho is zero, then this limit here holds. This was proven by Reich. And Brack and Reich proved, so this works in general for non-expensive maps. And Brack and Reich proved if T is strongly non-expensive, then this limit actually coincides to this. And we want to show that this one here is zero. This is the Bauschke solution. So what we have currently is that if this displacement is zero, then in fact, this asymptotic regularity holds. So we have a conditional Bauschke result under the assumption that the displacement is zero. And for that we analyzed first, that doesn't use any uh, set variable operator theory and the result is like, like this. You have to give a quantitative version of the assumption that the uh, displacement is zero, meaning no matter what epsilon you prescribe, you will find a point y so that the distance is smaller than epsilon and you need to have a bound on how big this epsilon is. Once you have such an alpha, you get a weight of asymptotic regularity. So we have solved the Bauschke problem quantitatively under this assumption. And now the main part of analyzing uh, Bauschke's uh, proof, however, is to extract such an alpha from his proof that indeed in his situation, this is zero, right? Okay, so in order to prove the zero displacement conjecture, what Bauschke then had to prove, now we are back in Hilbert space, that this is actually zero. And that's where the uh, uh, complicated operator theoretic part comes into the picture. So what we have to show is we have to extract an alpha uh, giving a quantitative bound on this uh, as in the previous result. And that, um, uh, is what I what I did and I don't go into the details I just want to say I, I just did it and at that time it wasn't really fully um, uh, covered by um, existing logical meter theorems because we had no treatment of uh, maximal set value operators so far but it just worked nicely and uh, together with uh, my PhD too. And Nicolas Pischke, we recently uh, actually showed that the existing meter theorems can be uh, augmented uh, to nicely allow for the treatment of that so that this particular analysis can actually be explained in logical terms. So the main point is a quantitative analysis of a deep theorem in maximum monotone operator theory called the precis Haru theorem, whatever that, that is. The only uh, point I want to make here in addition is a logical point uh, because it's a logic um, seminar, namely about this intentionality, extensionality issue. So how do we treat set-valued operators? So a set-valued operator 
on Hilbert space is a map from H to the power set of H. And there is this nice correspondence. So if the set, if the operator is a monotone, which just means in Hilbert space, uh, this. Okay, no, I shouldn't say this. Okay. I, that this is greater or equal than zero whenever u is in a of x and whenever v is in a of y. This means monotone. This actually generalizes the usual notion of monotone from R1. R1 yeah? So if an operator is monotone, then it turns out that this thing here, this set theoretically defined thing, is actually single value. And if the operator is maximum monotone, which means it hasn't any, the graph hasn't any proper extension, which is still monotone, then it's actually defined on all of H. And that's where the maximality comes into the picture. So if we have a maximum monotone operator, then there is a correspondence between the set valued operator and a very, which is a very ugly object and the very nice uh, resolvent which is single valued and it's non-expensive. And the connection, now this operator, the set valued operator, the only way to treat logically is via its graph. So we have a characteristic function for the, for the graph. And that of course, uh, oops, the characteristic function for the graph, yeah. And um, so this means here that this characteristic function applied to z and zero equals um, Zero. So we have here the characteristic function for A, and in this case, it would mean that this graph here equals as a natural number zero. So this is a quantifier-free statement. Now, the crucial connection between the operator and the resolvent is that any zero of the operator, meaning any point Z, such that zero is in the image of Z, is actually a fixed point of the resolvent and conversely. Now, this statement here recall that equality between objects in a non space is a defined notion. This is actually pi zero one. So, this is pi zero zero. This is quantifier free. This is pi zero one. And of course, we cannot state a result identifying the, 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 uh, the, the, the two, because then we could ask. Uh, how much of this universal quantifier do we need to establish this? And of course, there is no uh, bounding information available. I mean, this is a kind of comprehension axiom. So how do we treat this? Is it after all wrong to treat the operator intentionally via its characteristic function? Note why I'm saying intentionally, because we don't have the extensionality axiom. So we cannot prove uh, that if, let's say, a u equals v, and z equals uh, z tilde, and if u is in A of z, that then also v is in A of z tilde. This we cannot prove. But this is crucially needed to prove uh, this result here. So what do we say now instead of this? Well, um, thinking about um, the direction uh, from, uh, let, let's see, yeah, so we replace uh, this thing here by saying there is a point X which is close to zero and there is a point Z tilde which is, uh, which is equal to zero and there's a point Z tilde which is equal to Z and X equals is element in A of Z tilde. So in other words, we make this thing here extensional by uh, uh, going to this reformulation. So now uh, we weaken, therefore, the right hand side. So instead of saying if zero is in, I'm sorry, we weaken if we go from right to uh, left, we weaken the conclusion rather than saying if z is a fixed point, then saying then zero is, um, uh, then z is a zero, we just say this about zero. But the crucial thing is that the converse still holds. So from this fact, we can in fact conclude from this assumption that Z is a fixed point. So the proper reformulation of plus is actually um, this statement uh, that, um, okay, that, um, yeah, that uh, um, this year, that this is equivalent to uh, the resolvent uh, Z being a fixed point of the resolvent. Now, how is this proven? 
Well, the one direction to establish actually here from, let's remove this to re establish here uh, the direction from right to left goes as follows. What you can prove without extensionality is this thing, that the distance between Z and the resolvent of Z is an element of A of, not A of Z, but A of Ji of Z. Suppose now that Z is a fixed point. So then this is zero and then this is Z. And now if you assume that A is extensional, this means that zero is an element in A of Z. And that's how this works. Yeah. But, uh, if you avoid extensionality, what you get is you still have a point, namely this one, which is equal to zero, which is in not A of Z, but is in e A of something, namely J of Z, which is equal to Z. And that's precisely what we have here in, in the slide. And you know, in this way, you can move back and forth between the intentional world of the operator and the extensional world of the non-expensive map. The map is non-expensive, so as Lipschitz continues, so the area of extensionality is the consequence. Here you don't have extensionality, but you can move from the world of, of operators, uh, of um, uh, resolvents to the world of operators, perform arguments there, and later in, in a kind of, um, how to say, transform back the result into statements about fixed points of the Resolved. By the way, why are people so much interested in optimization about the zeros? Because if you have a so-called lower semi-continuous function from x to x augmented by uh, plus infinity, and you take as a to be the subdifferential of f, that is a maximum monotone operator, and a z is a zero of a if and only if it's a minimizer of f. And since optimization is about finding minimizers, basically optimization translates into finding zeros of such operators. And by plus here, uh, what is now going on? Here, by plus here, um, the question of zeros of operators translates into fixed points of the resultant. Okay, so that was so much about this thing. Now I want to talk about a different algorithm in optimization, uh, which is the so-called Tikhonov regularization method, which in this particular general form. So it was originally studied by uh, a well-known optimization person, Radu Botz, and it was generalized uh, by uh, Keval and uh, Loistian, and they call this the Tikhonov-Mann iteration, and it's of interest for various reasons. Many papers have been written about versions of that algorithm. The most important thing is that whereas usually algorithms only converge weakly in, in non-compact situations, this converts strongly, and it converts to a fixed point of T, and even a fixed point having special properties and blah. Moreover, this makes sense not only in convex subsets of norm spaces, but even in a large class of geodesic spaces. Okay. Now, why I'm talking about this? Because proof mining was recently used. I cut this a bit short, um, this debate. So we have a full quantitative analysis of this algorithm, but in particular, what we recently proved, so uh, Horacio Kival, uh, Lorenzo Loistian, and myself in, in a, one of the leading optimization journals, IOTA, uh, was linear rates of asymptotic regularity under suitable choice of scanners. And so this is currently a hot topic in optimization because these type of algorithms are used in machine learning and, you know, the, it was a, uh, came as a surprise when for the most simple form of that, the so-called Halpern iteration, the first um, linear bond was obtained in uh, 2017. But now we got this also for this uh, Tikhonov regularization method. So you see proof mining can produce results of low complexity all the way down to a bound of constant times n. So which means it's a very low complexity. Uh, result here. Okay, so now I'm running out of time. I just want to very briefly uh, come to the final uh, topic, some problem in uh, game theory. 
namely the classical is a problem of pursuit evasion games or cop robber games uh, or classical terminology the line and the main game it has been studied by Rado and was discussed in Littlewood's book um, and can be described as follows a line and a man in a circular arena have equal maximum speeds which tactics should the line employ to be sure of his meal so that's how Littlewood phrased it and so you now um, there are different ways in which you can define success. If you define success, the line hits the man. One can actually um, prove that he cannot, not even in a, in a circular arena. So this was uh, claimed first uh, um, by uh, Rado, but there was actually a mistake. And a counter example was found and Bisikovic showed that actually the man can escape. But um, if you define capture as epsilon capture, namely to say the line gets arbitrarily close to the man, then in fact um, the man, uh, the line succeeds. So no matter what uh, the man does, the line uh, uh, will get uh, epsilon close to the man. Now this problem has been studied uh, in very general uh, metric uh, settings and in particular it's much more general, but in particular in uniquely geodesic uh, spaces. Okay, so uniquely geodesic space means between two points as unique geodesic connecting them. Actually, one doesn't need the uniqueness, one even doesn't need the geodesic to set them, but forget the points. So then one can define what this line man game uh, means. So you have a sequence of moves of the man and of the line, and the line has to follow this geodesic between uh, uh, the um, he has to move via the geodesic. And um, there is a result um, by um, three analysts, Rimaro Lopez Acedo and Adriana Nicolai and uh, uh, Piatek, and that if X is compact and you have a unique geodesic space and you have some strange property between this property, which is mostly satisfied, but uh, it's a property, then in fact the line always wins in this epsilon. Uh, notion of winning. It means the limit gets to zero, it gets arbitrarily close. And the proof makes use iterated use of sequential compactness, which by reverse mathematics we know it's sequential compactness, arithmetic comprehension. So you make iterated use of arithmetic comprehension. So you might think of something like AC0, ACA0 plus or something can be used to formalize this if everything is, uh, you know represented in, in second order number theory. So they asked me whether this could be mined. And I said, yes, it can, because uh, this again is decreasing. So it's a for all exist statement. But I said, well, it will be probably very messy because of this nested use of arithmetic comprehension the bound could be very complicated. But then I actually changed my mind and started working on this. And we together actually showed the following things. The, what the proof mining first is doing is to upgrade this condition of betweenness. Uh, let's forget about this unique geodesic and uh, uniform unique geodesic. This is from the old slide. So this notion of betweenness into uniform betweenness. And this is actually the only trace of compactness which is used if the proof is set up properly. So if the space is compact, the arena is compact, then betweenness implies uniform betweenness. But the uniform betweenness also holds in all cases of interest, even though there are in general no compactness is there. So it's a very weak um, assumption to, uh, I mean, for all classes for which betweenness is known, also uniform betweenness is known. And despite of the fact that usually you never have compactness. And there's a quantitative notion of, this is a new notion which wasn't known before in this area, uniform between us. I mean, if you have time, I will comment on that. And there's a quantitative version of what it means to be a modulus of uniform between us. And now the point is, once you assume that, you can skip the compactness altogether and replace it by just metric boundedness so that the arena is bounded. Because you don't have compactness, there is no sequential compactness, so the sequential compactness arguments also disappear. 
So the need of arithmetic comprehension disappears. You can even skip, uh, this is what I said already, you can skip the uh, uniqueness of the geodesic. So you also in particular don't need uniform, uniquely geodesic. And you get a very simple rate of convergence, which essentially only depends on this modulus, which wasn't visible before. So you invent a new notion, uniform between us, you make it quantitative, and that is actually the key notion. Once you have that, you get your bound in addition to, of course, the error, the speed by which the, the man and the line are operating. And as I said, the set has to be bounded. So you have some bound on the diameter of A. And I mean, if we have time in the discussion, I can actually show the bound. It's a very simple uh, thing in these data. I just want to comment uh, briefly, because last time I talked about this, people said, well, what is between us? What is uniform between us? So I uh, added um, two slides on this. So this is the notion of betweenness. So a metric space satisfies the betweenness property if whenever you have four distinct points such that y is on a geodesic between x and z. That's what expressed by this here. So y is on a geodesic between x and z. And if Z is on a geodesic between Y and W, then Z is on the geodesic between X and W. That's what it says. Now, in a normed space, this is very closely related to strict convexity. So every strict and convex normed space satisfies that, but it's slightly weaker. There are examples of strictly convex, uh, of a strictly convex norm on R3, which is uh, on a non strictly convex norm on R3, which is nevertheless satisfies the between. Now, what is the logical form of this statement? The logical form of this statement is this one here. If you uh, express it and pre uh, you get this statement here. So you have a witness for the fact that these points were assumed to be distinct. So you have some lower bound on their mutual distance. We assume that the arena is bounded. Actually, we only need that this configuration of these, we have a bound on the diameter of these four points. And then, of course, uh, you know, we make quantitative these geodesic statements. So rather than saying we are on the geodesic, we say we are, uh, if these points are on the delta geodesic of this and the delta geodesic of this, then the point is on the epsilon geodesic of that. And if you write all this down, the next, uh, you get um, this uh, uh, statement here, which is, um, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, you get, get, get a statement, and if I scolemize it, you make a scolem function. Um, uh, oh, okay, okay. And then this is, no, no, I'm sorry, I was here too fast. I actually, uh, I saw, I skipped a slide. This is too bad when I prepared this. So this is already the uniformized version. If you pre-mix the, the statement, what you get is, um, what you get is for every epsilon and A and B, um, and x and y and z and w um, if this here happens uh, then there exists a delta such that and then that is delta and that is delta and now what we assume here is that this delta can be made uniform for these points so it doesn't depend on those points it just depends on these three data this is automatic if you assume compactness. But if you don't, this is a proper strengthening. And now to say that you have such a delta as a function on epsilon a and b, we now call it theta. This is what this uh, modulus is about. And so um, uh, in this notion, and you know, this can be easily computed. So for example, for all LP spaces, if p is, um, between one and two uh, strictly, then it's actually quadratic. And if P is bigger than two, then it's of order P, a polynomial of degree P. And in this Kromov class of Katzer kappa spaces, which are kind of Riemannian manifolds, it's always of order two, so it's quadratic. So you see, this is a typical thing. You get a very low complexity uh, theta, and in that, uh, this kind of, so 
it can be logically explained that theta is sufficient. It can be explained why in these cases you can extract theta, that it's in particular an application of proof mining, and you can combine both and you get a full concrete result for all the classes of interest. Okay, so I'm now finished. I uh, just want to, the final uh, uh, slides is about um, to indicate to you how, um, how active this research is. So I just list here those papers uh, which either appeared in 2023 or were posted in 2023. So the paper was appeared in December 2022, it's not included. So just to uh, see, okay, here you have uh, three slides. So these papers here, um, uh, the first two papers, uh, actually in some sense the first, yeah, the first three papers are on these Tikhonov regularization methods. And here, this is particularly interesting. Here was also a new qualitative result obtained uh, by proof mining by generalizing a result from Hilbert space to cut zero, which is an important uh, metric generalization. And it wasn't even qualitatively known to hold in the spaces. And this is a paper to appear in the number one journal in optimization, science journal on optimization. There's never been a proof mining paper in a science journal before, but now, now it is. Um, I did some other work on accretive operators with the student Findling. Then there is this Royal Society paper about accretive operators with Nicolas Pischke. So this is more on the logical side. All these papers are concrete uh, proof mining applications. And then um, again on this um, uh, Tikhonov uh, thing, uh, an application, again, it's a very good optimization journal. Then on the logical side, uh, recently Andre Sipush, together with uh, Paunescu, developed logical meter theorems for tracial von Neumann algebras. So that appeared in Mathematologic Quarterly. Pinto and Pischke, uh, Pinto is a postdoc of mine, and Pischke, a PhD student, they apply proof mining to important problems and uh, properties of Cauchy problems. This is one of the sources. You know, if you go from Hilbert space to Banner spaces, then the a proper generalization of being monotone is accretive, and accretive operators describe Cauchy problems, and so that's the, the connection. Then Pischke had developed a logical framework for accretive and uh, operators using these intentional relations. This is uh, just appeared in the Journal of Mathematical Logic, and. Here's another application of his approach in the Journal of Convex Analysis. Here's another application of Pischke to an important optimization algorithm. Here's some application that's more in the spirit of Kreisel by Thomas Powell to a Tauberian uh, theory. So it's more about you know, yeah, analytic number theory, one might say. There's another paper by on accretive operators, and uh, here this paper which I had mentioned on super strongly non-expensive maps. Uh, and there are two surveys if you want to learn more about this. This is written here for logicians, but it's not completely brand new. Uh, here is a bit more newer version of my ICM paper, which is written for general and mathematical audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was, in fact, it was the first time I think that I've seen proof mining. I find interesting the way the way it works, the way one can prove mathematics stuff while looking in this analysis. So, are there any questions? Yeah, maybe I, I have a I have a naive question. So uh, you said you said that uh, you can use like uh, you can use proof mining for optimization uh, yes. in in optimization. Yes. Uh, it it seems it seems very natural to use it in optimization. Do you do you know of any other um, application in nature? Something that uh, applying proof mining to get a result that does not depend on, uh, that, that's not optimization result. It's like yeah, I mean, 
One thing is this line man game. This is by itself nothing to do with optimization. It's more like a, 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 yeah, a game theoretic uh, thing which plays a role in robotics yeah, because you can give many variants of this line man game. You have several lines and several min, and so you can actually describe this as a robot trying to avoid an obstacle because it's the same problem if you say whether the robot hits the obstacle or can avoid it as is as basically an equivalent formulation of the line man game and so there are lots of papers in robotics uh, about this so that's a different area uh, then i mentioned uh, this work on abstract cushy problems uh, you know this um, uh, this is actually where people then go to general banner spaces. There you have a uh, generalized notion of being monotone, which is called accretive. It's a bit more messy to state. And many problems, even the famous Navier-Stokes equation, uh, can be written as uh, given by um, uh, an accretive operator. And uh, then one can apply the general theory. There's a so called nonlinear semi group theory, and blah, blah, blah. There's exponential formula, you know, everything, and not everything, but many things which had been developed for the, for the linear case uh, make also sense in the nonlinear case. So this started to become an explosively big area in the 70s by work of Crindle, Liggett, and, uh, and so on. And the French school, uh, in particular, Brésis, and uh, and many people uh, worked on this um, and it's still a very active uh, area and we now have many uh, applications there. I have uh, two papers with uh, Kutsuko Angeliki, a PhD student, uh, a former PhD student of mine, and now um, Pinto and Pishke have several very uh, strong results on, on PDEs uh, using this. Yet another area is, I think I include, mentioned this in the abstract, but I went already over time with my selected uh, you know, treatment here, is ergodic theory. So I have two papers, a uh, recent paper with Anton Freund, where we apply proof mining to uh, nonlinear er ergodic theory. And uh, we have papers before, so there have been also some 10 papers on that. Actually, the first applications of Proof mining I did uh, 30 years ago were in approximation theory with Chebyshev based on one approximation. I stated in my PhD work there is a very interesting result in approximation theory which can be proven using the Koenig's lemma. And I said, okay, because I have an elimination of the Koenig's lemma, I can extract a certain bound, but I actually didn't carry it out at that time. So that was still an, uh, a problem, you know, left as an exercise. Uh, where the success was basically guaranteed by a meter theorem, but it never had been done. And so that was recently uh, done by Andre Siposch, and it appeared, I think, this year or last year in a very good journal of Mathematische Nachrichten. So this is about a um, best approximation problem uh, where you have restrictions on the coefficients. They have to belong to some convex set, and that makes the situation much more complicated than, than the usual. Uh, polynomial approximation. So these, um, then I think, yeah, then uh, Thomas uh, Powell had results on Tauberian theorems. Uh, Paulo Lieber has applications in financial uh, mathematics uh, recently. Uh, so, yeah, so many things. So I, I believe, I mean, if, if there's time, I can elaborate on this. I believe that um, analysis is particularly fruitful. But of course, um, Algebraic things uh, can be also done. Henry Tausner, uh, together with collaborators, used proof mining uh, about results, uh, you know, giving bounds on things which were non effectively proven by people like Van and Dries and using uh, ultra techniques. So that's also possible. I mean, uh, historically, my PhD supervisor in 85 uh, got the first polynomial bounds on Herbert. On, on Roth's theorem on Diophantine approximation, you know, this is a Fields Medal winning result by Roth, proven in 55. There were only exponential bounds on the number of solutions known, and by uh, proof analysis using a kind of Herbron style analysis, uh, Luca produced um, the first polynomial bounds. So, uh, I mean, also in that. This has never been pushed further, but I think in that area of Diophantine approximation, there are certainly also uh, some market for applications. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? 
If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.